Well, Wednesday night's game was certainly the worst performance of the season by the Orioles, both on offense and on the mound. But they did add a player earlier the day Wednesday, acquiring Luis Torrens in a trade with the Chicago Cubs. So I'll recap all of the Orioles' action Wednesday in Birdland coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Thursday, May 4th, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we're going to start by recapping what was a rough, rough game in Kansas City on Wednesday night. Orioles falling 6-0 to the Royals. For the first time this season, basically showed no life for nine innings of a game. I mean, that was the biggest stinker of the year. I'll get to the five things you need to know from that one. And then we'll break down the Orioles' first in-season trade of the year. They acquired the catcher Luis Torrens from the Chicago Cubs for cash considerations. Talk about why the O's brought him in, what they have to do with him roster-wise, what the corresponding move was, and how long he could stick around in Baltimore. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Rocket Money. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. So let's start today with a tough, tough Orioles loss. I am not going to talk a whole lot about this game because although I did watch most of it on Wednesday night, I, I could not stomach the last couple of innings. It was the worst performance of the year for the Orioles, bar none. I mean, even in games this year where, you know, it's gotten maybe a little bit away from them early in the game. Although you can't even really say this game got away from them early. But games where you just feel like, you know what, this isn't the Orioles night. They have still had some fight in those games throughout the year. But they were shut out for the first time this season on Wednesday night. And quite frankly, there wasn't a lot of fight shown at all by the Orioles. I mean, even the one game this year that you could call kind of a blowout loss for the O's, or at least at one point it was, was that game against Boston back on the 25th where they were down 8-2 to two and then really down 8-1 to one in the ninth, and then Henderson hit the homer and Mullins hit the grand slam and they got back in the game. There was no getting back in the game on Wednesday night. Orioles fall 6-0 to the Kansas City Royals, which evens up this three-game series at one game apiece. For the Orioles, with the loss, they drop to 20-10 and 10 on the season. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from this game. And the first thing you need to know is that the Orioles' offense simply forgot to show up in this game. I don't know if they thought they had the day off. I don't know if they got to the ballpark late, they didn't sleep well, whatever it was. The Orioles offense was literally basically non-existent in this one. No runs for the first time all season. And it's even weirder coming a day after they scored 11 runs in the win on Tuesday night. But they're unable to score. They muster just six hits as a team. They only draw one walk in this entire game for a team that's been walking a lot. And it was just a a straight up nothing from the Orioles in this one. I mean, Zach Greinke just had them... Not even looking silly because it's not like he was getting swings and misses and lots of strikeouts. It was just they seemed kind of disinterested in this game. Zach Granke went five scoreless innings, allowed three hits, three Ks, no walks. But the weirdest thing was, and we haven't gotten an update on this. I'm recording here just before 10 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday night. Haven't gotten an update yet, but Zach Granke, they pulled him out of the game at 44 pitches through five scoreless innings. You have to think it was an injury, but... That was just odd. And then Taylor Clark, Aroldis Chapman, Amir Garrett, and Josh Stalmont each threw very easy scoreless innings. And the O's just kind of drifted away into the wind. Second thing you need to know from this one is that really the only guy who did much at all offensively in this game was Anthony Santander. He was the only player to have two hits 
in the game. Another Oriole, Adam Frazier, did get on base twice with a single and a walk. But Santander had two singles in the game and a two for four night with a hard hit ball. He's got his average up to 233 OPS at 668 on the year. That makes it back to back two hit games for Santander in this series. Now three out of his last four games have been multi hit games for Santander. So maybe the bat's starting to come around. He's still not flashing any power at all, which is weird for the Orioles' 2022 home run leader. But at least he's starting to hit a little bit because it would be nice to get his bat going in the middle of this lineup. Third thing you need to know from this one as we switch it over to the pitching side, Kyle Gibson was downright horrendous in this game. This was one of the weirder starts that really you will kind of ever see from a guy. Kyle Gibson gave up 17 hard hit balls in this game. Let me say that again. 17 hard hit balls. He only allowed 10 hits, which is a lot. But when you think about 17 hard hit balls, seven hard hit balls turned into outs as well. Gibson goes six and two thirds, allowing six runs on 10 hits, no strikeouts, no walks, one homer allowed and threw just 74 pitches to get his ERA up to 4.61 on the season. It was Gibson's worst start as an Oriole. He had no stuff working. I mean, as you can tell from zero strikeouts. Now he was throwing strikes, which was good. It was a different from his bad start last week in Detroit when he threw 102 pitches to only get through four and a third and he wasn't throwing a lot of strikes. He was throwing basically all strikes in this game. Just none of them were quality strikes. The Royals swung at 40 Kyle Gibson pitches in this game. 40 of his 74 pitches they swung. They swung and missed once on one Gibson sweeper. It was early in the game against Bobby Witt Jr. Was the only swing and miss the entire day. This is the worst Gibson start of the year. This was the worst Orioles start of the year, I think. And that includes, you know, some bad starts from Dean Kramer, a really bad start from Kyle Bradish a couple weeks ago. This was 17 hard hit balls against the worst offense in baseball run output wise. The Royals averaged 3.3 runs per game. That's the worst in baseball. Yet somehow, if Gibson would have come out after six innings, he would have been awarded a quality start. That's how weird this start was. And frankly, how weird this game was for the Orioles. Despite having nothing, basically, Kyle Gibson through six innings was at two runs. Because they were just pounding the ball into the ground or hitting the ball right at fielders or he was just getting lucky. And then the wheels just came off. He allowed four earned runs, a bunch of hits in the seventh inning when the Royals pulled away. Just bad. I mean, none of the pitches working. Nobody getting swings and misses. 17 hard hit balls. Hopefully he can turn this thing around from that one. Fourth thing you need to know from this one, kind of on the same path as Kyle Gibson's bad start, but Brandon Hyde just had a really weird managerial decision to make in this game. And it has to do with that sixth and seventh inning. I mean, Gibson, even though he had only allowed two runs through six innings, he was at like 55 pitches through six innings. Now he was getting hit hard and it wasn't pretty at all. And he had just one swing and miss, but the Orioles offense was doing nothing. They had conjured up nothing through six innings scoreless. You're down to nothing. And your veteran innings eater is at just 55 pitches through six innings. And it's only two runs allowed. So no matter how bad he had looked, it's hard to pull him from the game there, right? I mean, you know, you've got bullpen decisions to make. You don't want to have to have your bullpen go two or three innings when your starter's at 55 pitches and there's only two runs on the board. I mean, you got a day game tomorrow. You've got Grayson Rodriguez, who, although he's pitching well, has not gone past five innings. So you know you're going to need your bullpen Thursday. Then you have six straight days against the two best teams in baseball, three against Atlanta, three against the Rays. You're going to need your bullpen there. So I understand the decision by Brandon Hyde to leave Gibson in at 55 pitches. But I also get the pushback that's like, he looked terrible Your bullpen's been amazing, and if you can keep it at a 2-0 game, maybe, just maybe, your offense at some point wakes up against a not-so-great Royals bullpen and finds their way back into this game. I get it. A, the Orioles offense never woke up, and B, I don't think you can pull your starter at 55 pitches, and Hyde had to pull him in the seventh because it got so bad. He had given up three runs and another inherited run scored as well after Keegan Aiken came in, and it was nice that Aiken 
although he didn't pitch well, did get the final four outs. So the Orioles only had to use one reliever still. But it was just a tough decision for Hyde. And I really don't blame him for keeping Gibson in the game. I would have done the same thing. Just a weird, weird spot with how weird that game is. And, and that's the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 6 nothing loss to the Royals. This was an incredibly weird baseball game. It took an hour and 59 minutes. An hour and 59 minutes. And yes, some of that had to do with the pitch clock. But a lot was because guys were just swinging at the first pitch, beating the ball into the ground, getting out. Orioles were grounding into double plays. There basically weren't any walks in this game. I mean... You know, Orioles didn't walk anybody. The Royals only walked one guy in this game. Not a whole lot of strikeouts, really, either. I mean, the Royals only struck out six batters. The Orioles didn't strike anybody out in this game or walk anybody. Just a really weird game. So it moves along. It hums along. Yeah, the four-run seventh by the Royals extended a little bit. But you had Zach Greinke, who I mentioned, just 44 pitches and five scoreless innings for this version of Zach Greinke with a six ERA. That was weird. Then Greinke coming out of the game and just sitting in the dugout looking healthy. I have to think something was a little off for him to come out of the game at 44 pitches. I mean, he threw 84 pitches in his last start. It's not like the 39-year-old future Hall of Famers on an innings limit or a pitch limit. Just weird, weird stuff. And then Kyle Gibson being terrible, but also okay early in the game and also pitching deep into this game and... Kyle Isbell in the seventh inning, fouling a ball off home plate and directly into his nose and his eye. I I don't know what was going on in this game. I I want to forget this game pretty much as quick as possible. And that's what I'm going to try to do. And hopefully the Orioles do it as well and go ahead and win a series on getaway day here on Thursday. But, and this may have happened as you listen or watch this already, The Orioles may have uh, a reinforcement on the roster to try and win this series on Thursday as they acquired the catcher Luis Torrens in a trade with the Chicago Cubs on Wednesday. So coming up next, I'll tell you who is Luis Torrens and why the Orioles may have brought him in. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. It can be easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you. And you may never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. It is important to take time for yourself at at any given time, just little times in the day throughout the week. Therapy, though, can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. Therapy has worked for me, and it can work for you as well. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnMLB to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnMLB. So the Orioles, it was a stinker Wednesday night. They fall to the Royals 6-0 in Kansas City, but they did add a player to the roster earlier on Wednesday. The Orioles acquiring the 27-year-old catcher Luis Torrens in a trade with the Chicago Cubs that sent cash considerations over to Chicago in the deal. Uh, Torrens had been DFA'd by the Cubs a few days ago, and so the Orioles basically made a claim, and then they send cash to make sure they get him over any other team who may have claimed him. It's how the Orioles acquired guys like Danny Coulomb and and Ryan O'Hearn and different guys this offseason in that kind of cash considerations trade after a guy is DFA'd. So you may be wondering, who is Luis Torrens? Because even though he's been basically back and forth, but has been some some time in the big league since at least 2017. He is not exactly a household name. Well, Luis Torrens is a 27-year-old right-handed hitting catcher who first came up to the big leagues with the San Diego Padres all the way back in 2017. Now, there's really only been one year where he was a, I wouldn't say everyday player, but a legitimate guy who was playing a lot in somebody's lineup Other than that, he's been a backup catcher, a third catcher, a 4A guy, an up-down guy. In 2021 with the Mariners, he did play 108 games and have 378 plate appearances. That also happened to be his best season when he had a 101 WRC plus and a .3 war. But other than that, been kind of a part-time player for San Diego, Seattle, and Chicago. 
He was released by the Mariners. He was non-tendered this offseason by Seattle when he became arbitration eligible after he had a really, really tough 2022 with the Mariners. Coming off a great season in 2021, as I mentioned, he had 15 home runs that year, was a little versatile defensively, but was just bad in 2022. 166 plate appearances. He hit just 225 with a 283 on base and a 298 slugging, just a 72 WRC plus with a 30% strikeout rate in 2022. He was not very good, was worth negative war. So the Mariners non-tendered him. He became a free agent and he signed a minor league deal with the Chicago Cubs. Now it was going to pay him 1.2 million if he was in the big leagues. And he was, he made the Cubs and while he didn't play a lot, he was basically the backup catcher option for Chicago while DHing against some left as well played in 13 games for the Cubs this season before being DFA'd and in 22 plate appearances Luis Torrens was five for 20 at the dish for Chicago with a home run a double four RBIs 10 strikeouts and three walks on the year now he is a right-handed hitter and not exactly a big time bat because you look at the stats and a 76 WRC plus this season 72 last season but he is a guy who has hit lefties in the past. Now, in his career, he has about 800 career plate appearances, a 79 career WRC+, plus, which means in his big league career, he has been 21% worse than a league average hitter. But he's had a 98 WRC+, plus against lefties versus 66 against righties. So he's at least been league average against lefties and really bad against righties. Now, the reason why he got chances to DH for the Cubs this year, despite those offensive numbers, for the Cubs this season, he DH'd in seven games, he caught four games, and he played left field in one game. But the reason why was because of what he did in that 2021 season. I mentioned how he was pretty good for the Mariners that year. That's because he mashed left-handers that season. He was kind of a guy who the Mariners played either as DH or catcher or in other positions on the field every time a lefty was out there just to get his bat in the lineup. Think of kind of a Hanser Alberto type player where he had a 131 WRC plus against left-handed pitching in 2021. So that could be one of the reasons why the Orioles ended up acquiring him, a guy who they think can hit some lefties as well. Now he has a little bit of defensive versatility. He's come up as a catcher. That's been his main position, but he has at least a little bit played first base, second base, third base and left field in the big leagues before. So he has a little bit of versatility that we know Mike Elias and the Orioles love. Now he's not great at any of those positions. And in fact, I wouldn't even say he's good at any of those positions defensively he rates out as a below average pitch framer a really bad pitch blocker shout out to Statcast for having a stat for pitch blocking now and he has basically a league average pop time that's how long it takes him to from catching a pitch to getting the ball down to second base on a throw down to try and get a caught stealing so he's not a super impressive player that's why he was dfa'd by the cubs as well but you're probably wondering well why did the Orioles pick him up. I think one is to have some catching depth and two is to maybe get a guy who can hit lefties, but he's out of minor league options. So the Orioles can't just send him down to triple a. Now he wasn't on the roster. They didn't add him to the roster for Wednesday's game, but he's going to have to be put on the roster for Thursday. So the question really becomes why go after a guy like that? Why they do it? Is he actually going to be on the roster and who did he replace and who will he replace? Answer all those questions coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Rocket Money. Now, I want you to sit there and think, how much money do you spend on subscriptions every single year among all the things you subscribe to? The total for most Americans is close to $200 a month. And if you don't know exactly how much you're spending every month, you need Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people have subscriptions they just forgot about, and chances are you are one of them. Well, Rocket Money will quickly and easily find your subscriptions for you, and for any you don't want to pay anymore, just hit cancel and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. They'll do the work for you. 
It's that easy. And over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. So stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. That's rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. One more time, rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. So it was a tough day for the O's losing 6-0 to the Royals, but they did acquire Luis Torres, the 27-year-old catcher, in a trade with the Chicago Cubs for cash considerations on Wednesday. Now, the interesting part about Torres is he is out of minor league options. That is why the Cubs had to DFA him when they made a roster move a couple of days ago. They got Cody Bellinger back from the paternity list, and they DFA'd Luis Torres. Now, because he's out of minor league options, the Orioles, A, had to claim him, put him on the 40-man roster, and B, they have a, basically a day to put him on the active roster. Now, they didn't immediately send him to Kansas City and roster him for Wednesday night. But unless the O's plan on immediately DFAing Terenz, which they could, I could see it happen where the O's try to DFA Terenz themselves, pass him through waivers and keep him in the organization. They've done it with guys before. Unless they do that, they're going to need to probably put him on the roster before Thursday's game. So first of all, what was the corresponding move? Because the Orioles did have a full 40-man roster. Well, the Orioles decided to DFA Joey Crable to make room for Luis Torrens. Now, a little bit of a surprise because Crable spent basically all of 2022 in the Orioles' bullpen. And by all accounts, he was the first or second guy to miss out on making the Orioles' opening day roster out of the bullpen. Now, Crable last year, you know, about 58 innings, a 3.90 ERA, he faded down the stretch. He was much better in the first half, but he was a solid middle relief option for a while for the Orioles after they claimed him off waivers from the Rays back in 2021. But he wasn't as good down the stretch. He wasn't as good in spring training, and he hasn't been very good in AAA this year. For the Norfolk Tides, Crable has thrown nine innings. He's allowed just two earned runs on five hits, but he's walked seven batters while striking out just six. The command that was really there for him last year has not been there in AAA. And honestly, I think because of that, the O's do have a chance of slipping Crable through waivers and keeping him in the organization. That's what they would like because he still has some promise. They would like to keep him in the org, I would think, and just have him be off the 40 man. But we will see a, a bad team could totally claim him and put him back in the big leagues, but probably helps the O's in this case that he's not pitching super well right now. So they could get him all the way through waivers. But the O's are going to have to make another move if they want to keep Torrens. Again, they could just DFA him right away, try to keep him in the roster, but he's out of minor league options. So you got to put him on the big league roster. Now, you can't send a pitcher down because you have to keep 13 pitchers and 13 hitters. So there's basically two guys at this point that the O's could make the move with. And again, as you're listening to this, this could be outdated. I'm speaking here on 10 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday night. The Orioles have yet to make the official move that would put Terenz on the roster, but it's probably going to be one of two guys. It's either going to be Kyle Stowers or Ryan O'Hearn that goes to AAA. Now, both do have minor league options, so both of those guys can just be sent down uh, you know, without having to be DFA'd. You might lean Stowers because he's already been optioned once this year, but the fact that they just recalled him on when or on Sunday, I should say, and he started two of the three games since then. Stowers did have a hit, a one for two with a hard hit ball on Wednesday, hitting in the five hole, playing left field, also made a phenomenal play in left field, gunning out a runner at the plate on a two out base knock in the second inning. It was a heck of a throw, laser to home plate to just get the runner. So an impressive day defensively, he made a couple of nice catches in left field as well. I do think it's going to be Ryan O'Hearn. Now, O'Hearn went 0 for 2 with two strikeouts, got the start at first base in his Ryan O'Hearn revenge game, the return to Kansas City for him on Wednesday night. But James McCann replaced him as a pinch hitter late in the game against a lefty, and then McCann did play the bottom of the eighth defensively at first base. And remember, the Orioles started the season without O'Hearn. They started the year without that backup first base guy with James McCann. And specifically, if you are going to put Terenz on the roster, who gives you a third catcher, that gives you the ability to play McCann at first base some if you want to DH Ryan Mountcastle more or maybe give him a day off or two. So you really don't need the backup first baseman if you have the three catchers because McCann can play first base. So I do think 
it's probably going to be Ryan O'Hearn. You know, he had a couple RBIs early. He is hitting 263, but not really hitting for power. Just a 634 OPS and limited chances with the O's this year. I think he probably goes back down to AAA and we see Terenz at least for a little bit. Now, who knows how long it's going to be for Terenz in the big leagues with the Orioles. We've seen the O's carry three catchers this season before. Remember, James McCann started the year on the injured list, so Anthony Benboom was on the roster to back up Adley Rutschman. But when McCann was added to the roster, when he was activated off the IL, they actually kept Ben Boom around as well for the next four games, just so they can, you know, DH McCann, start Adley behind the plate and still have a backup catcher. So if you have to pinch hit or an injury happens, you know, you don't have to burn the DH in a game when you have that third catcher. And Terenz gives you a little flexibility because like McCann, you can DH him against a lefty. You can also have him play a little bit in the infield or the outfield if you absolutely have to. You know, he's a little more versatile as well than a guy like Anthony Bemboom to carry that third catcher. And he just has a higher upside as a hitter, as a player than Bemboom does as well to carry as your third guy. So I think they'll carry him for a bit. Who knows how long it's going to be? But uh, obviously the O's see something here that even I'm not seeing, which it's totally fine. You know, they got a lot more data than we do that they wanted to go after Terenz. They thought it was worth the risk of DFAing Joey Crable and putting him on the roster to somehow help the team at this point. He could also stick around for a week. The O's could DFA him again, and maybe he slips through and the O's keep him in AAA. But I will say the one last reason the O's did go ahead and get Luis Terenz here is that they need some catching depth right now because Maverick Handley just went on the injured list in AAA Norfolk. He got called up to Norfolk this year. He just went on the IL. They're going to be without him for a little bit, which meant Anthony Benboom was the only catcher on the AAA roster. So if the O's did want to carry three catchers, they couldn't call up Benboom because their backup catcher right now is Taryn Vavra. He played an inning behind the dish on Wednesday night. He played an inning behind the dish on Tuesday as well. So he's the backup catcher. So you do need another catcher at AAA. Now, you can't just send Terenz down there. You can't just send McCann down there because he's been too good. And he also doesn't have minor league options. So it'll be interesting what the O's do. But maybe this third catcher buys them some time, allows you to keep Ben Boom in AAA, allows you to call somebody up from AA as just a quick fix to be the backup catcher in Norfolk. And then maybe down the line, you do DFA Terenz You get him through waivers. He becomes your second catcher at Norfolk, and he becomes depth for you. I think that could be the plan for Mike Elias and his staff. But that's what we're looking at right now. Luis Terenz becoming an Oriole again. Expect him to probably be activated here on Thursday. Might have already happened as you're listening to this. And uh, again, I think it'll be O'Hearn, but we will see what the move is and what Terenz can do for the Orioles. Speaking of Orioles catchers, did just want to shout out Robinson Chirinos, who announced his official retirement from baseball on Wednesday. Yeah, he didn't have good stats with the Orioles in his one year with the O's last year. Bad hitter, bad defender, but was a great clubhouse guy. Every Oriole basically raved about him. Brandon Hyde loved him and did play a big role in the Orioles turning things around last year. Maybe not on the field, but off the field, especially in that clubhouse. He's going to be a great coach one day, and uh, I can't wait for that chapter of Robinson Chirinos' life. But that will do it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. We've got one more episode coming up this week as we're back tomorrow. I will recap the day game between the Orioles and the Royals. O's will go for their seventh consecutive series win. Seventh consecutive series win. That would be uh that would be pretty impressive and you hope they can get it against a bad Royals team. Grayson Rodriguez goes for the O's coming off his best start of the season. It's a 2:10 p.m. Eastern time start and an old friend gets the ball for the Kansas City Royals. It is none other than dad himself, the innings eater himself, nom 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 goes Jordan Lyles on the mound for the Royals tomorrow. The 32-year-old righty has not been good. I know Kyle Gibson's last couple of starts have not been great, but the O's may have made the right decision here. Lyles has a 6.11 ERA in six starts so far this year. His last time out against the Twins, he gave up seven runs on seven hits over four innings of work. I love Jordan Lyles, but I hope the O's hit him around and they get a series win. We'll recap game three on tomorrow's episode. I'll do another edition of my bullpen trust power rankings and then we'll get you ready for a huge series this weekend in atlanta two of the best records in baseball orioles and braves 
get you set for that coming up on tomorrow's episode. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.